We've been very fortunate to have a very distinguished set of thinkers uh, with us today and yesterday, and uh, including all of the panel that we're, we're dealing with now. Uh, one of those members that has not yet been introduced is, is Philip Beasley. Uh, he's a professor of the School of Architecture at Waterloo, a practitioner of architecture and digital media art. Um, he was educated in visual arts at Queen's University in technology at, at Humber College and in architecture at the University of Toronto. At Waterloo, he, he serves as the director of the Integrated Group of Visualization, Design, and Manufacturing, and as director for uh, Riverside Architectural Press. He also holds the position of um, examiner at the University College London. His Toronto-based practice, uh, PBI, PBAI, is an interdisciplinary design firm that combines public building buildings with exhibition design. Uh, staging and light, lighting projects. The, the studio's methods incorporate industrial design, digital prototyping, and uh, mechatronic engineering. Philip Beasley's work is widely cited in a rapidly expanding technolo technology of responsive architecture. He's authored and edited eight books and, a, and appears on the cover of, has appeared on the cover of Artificial Life, uh, which is an MIT publication, Leonardo, and AD Journal. Features include uh, National CBS News, Casa, Casa Vogue, Wired, and um, a series of TED Talks. His work was selected to represent the Canada at the 2010 Venice Biennale for Architecture, and he has been recognized by the Prix de Rome in Architecture. Philip. Thank you for that generous introduction, and I, I am so very happy to be here among such extraordinarily distinguished colleagues. It really is a privilege to be able to, to join in this event. I'm going to be speaking to you as a craftsperson uh, who will be presenting a series of projects which come before new amorphic architecture. These projects do not have brains. They don't have consciousness. They barely have subsumption, that is, that is the, the individual loops, perhaps, that, that, that make, make for a reflex from, from my ganglion and my elbows to, to, my, to my fingers or in my knee to my feet. They do have some interconnectivity in them. And most particularly, they are tuned perhaps in the terms that, that Harry offered in, the, in their tectonic precision, following, I think, a rather different paradigm than Vitruvius taught us in seeking permanence and use. Because I think in contrast to the wish to produce a sense of stable orientation and certitude, this body of work relishes the experience of rolling down a hill and making yourself dizzy. The sense that in play and in happiness, a shift of boundaries, an expansion of boundaries, and an interpersonal kind of sharing of, of space becomes an absolutely delicious and natural and very, very familiar way of working. And this could be called an architecture which can only exist in excess, in a time of peace, in a time of plenty. But I hope that I can justify the kind of particular crafts that I, that I share with you today as offering a kind of resilience and economy through quite specific methods of interconnections and quite specific methods of, of design, which would stand for a very robust kind of sustainability, not the sustainability of absolute control and, min and min minimum energy footprints, but rather through a profound buffering interconnectedness that comes from strategies like dynamics relaxation and force shedding 
and textile-based strategies, mapped on to then some new processes of active response and active metabolisms. So this body of work, which has been done with a great deal of, of intuition rather, rather than planning and conscious purpose, is perhaps primed for this gathering. This is why I'm so delighted to, to be here, um, because this, if this is a body without organs and a body without brain, then it's the most wonderful opportunity to meet some brains and some consciousness. I can't wait to be able to, to collaborate. I very much hope that that will be possible. These are the kind of environments that I and my colleagues have, have been doing in, in Toronto and Waterloo um, with, with cells from, from now Newcastle and, and Nottingham and, and uh, a couple of other centres in Europe, um, in, in, in Copenhagen, for example, and in, in Waterloo. And this kind of work might be conceived as a kind of soil, that is a layer matrix which is very deliberately open carefully put together, enriched by, by, by multiple layers which are primed for response as a kind of very deliberate transitional field, open, inviting fertility. And they're framed with a basic sense of a question. Where am I? And where am I standing? And what is the ground that supports me? Is it the ground? that Vitruvius taught us could be firm and whole and reliable, holding us with certitude, holding us with the beautiful comfort of the world which always we will be with us and which cradles us and the parents which precede us and the stable cultures which precede us? Or is it a different kind of ground, a ground which trembles, which even threatens to die, a ground which engenders a very different kind of response in architecture than the kind of proud emplacement that even Mies van der Rohe offered us in that extraordinary kind of stripped humanist stage of the Neue Stadt's gallery, trying to strip away past culture but, but offering a kind of proud freedom, a, a belief that's, that's so, that's, uh, that a kind of social stage would hold us. I think that the architecture that offers emplacement today does require some different kinds of strategy then were marked perhaps 200 years ago when the task might have been one of finding sensitive filters to hold us in relationship to a stable world, or perhaps 50 years ago in which an architecture might have had the task of finding justice and care and empathy in a social axis, but stabilizing the world again. Instead, this seems to be a time in which architecture needs to create fertility, needs to create its own realms which can heal and renew. In a stable world, that sense of the form language and the relationship systems that might, op might uh, op offer a strategy for designing architect architecture are not simple but they are ones which have been recited for 2,000 years. This beautiful sense of finding simplest possible filters which then amplify our experience with the world, perhaps embodied in Plato's world by thinking about a sphere or perhaps a cube, certainly a reductive form. And yet when I think about the kind of form language of purity and of clear boundaries, perhaps Im embedded in a sphere. I feel very apprehensive. I'm showing this slide because I, I, I heard that consciousness might be this kind of rippling out and latency of rebound in, 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 in the world. And the form language of architecture by implication then might be one primarily that of a raindrop. This beautiful form, apparently beautiful, which has a minimum surface and a maximum possible interior. And so, in spite of that beauty, and in spite of that particular kind of connection with the environment, the, re the rebound, it seems to me that this is also a form language which is a kind of machine for resisting reaction, at least in, its, in terms of its arithmetics for its reaction face, because after all, a sphere is the least possible geometry 
for reacting with the world, the least possible exposure, the greatest possible enclosing territory. So as a form language guiding architecture, it would be very effective for guiding ballistics and forts and banks and places where we're cold and we want to harvest heat, but it's the worst possible form, surely, if we want to relate, if we want to get rid of heat, if we want to have maximum reaction. How very curious that we're taught that this is a good form then, when it also speaks of death in a particular circumstance, that is, when you're trying to cool down. And so I want to speak about a different kind of form language as a corrective. That is dissipative form, that is, that is of deliberately reticulated outreaching form in which maximum surface area and maximum reaction and maximum potency is, is guided rather than the minimizing fort-like fort, fort tangents of the form language which in classical canons are taught. This work tries to work, by the way, you can turn off the sound um, throughout. This work tr tries to generate incremental, gentle, ambient kind of, kind of res responses uh, working around us. And it does so by trying to find very gently reticulated forms made out of multiple components that are tuned for maximum resonance and, and, and ma maximum reaction. There are emotional qualities in the work. There's kind of a, 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 a pathetic quality to, to some of it. This, this, this particular one is, is primed so that if you move very quickly, uh, being tracked by the sensor arrays, it convulses. And then if you move very slowly, then it will chill and calm down. And the trouble in, the, in, the, in, the, in this case is that those two start hiccuping and can't make up their mind. And so rather than creating a benign responsive architecture, one makes something that's mentally ill. A more gentle response, though, perhaps, perhaps in, in, in more optimism, is one in which very, very small, deliberately lightweight, deliberately fra fragile elements ripple out, engendering a kind of expanded physiology that's very close to your skin and your muscles. Embedded within that kind of series of environments more recently are the first generations of chemical metabolisms that are set up to, to, to foster ex exchange. Precip precipitation, capturing carbon, for example, translating it into harmless carbonate, gen generating chemical felts, copper and, uh, and iron felts that might be the first generations of, 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 sk of skins, perhaps making ivies uh, surrounding buildings in the future. Here you can see some, some of the, the, the chaining together of those layers, such as was done in, done in Venice, in which these were set up to process water through a, a, a filtering bed. Here you can just see some of the chemical skins. This is, is copper sulfate with, with, the, with, with the, a, a lovely uh, copper and, and, and iron felt bloom, blooming out under osmosis. Perhaps making sticky messes um, and needing to be, to be housed in, in, in glass vessels and, man, and manifolds for now, but setting up the possibility of very active exchanges in the future. I've lost everything. I want the next one to work. I'm saying please. I don't think it's going to. Oh, that's too bad. That was a nice um, series of clips which, which, which took the, the, the chemical cells and then showed them embedded throughout an environment in, in Seoul. Here's a still from the same, the same project. Um, and, and then which, which, which is embedded with an environment in which there was not only reflexive loops and responses, but also a rather interesting second generation of, of response, which was self-triggering, in which the electronic systems were also d directly being brushed against by, 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 the, by the physical rebounds. And so that set up a, a, a kind of a, a looping and a, a happily hic hiccuping continuing system, which I, which I did want to refer to. Um, please just, just imagine that happening. And I'll, 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 you, know, I'm, I, you have to trust me, you see. Um, there's layers also that I was going to be speaking about in, in, in that slide, which has internal power generation. The little blue materials here are, are a vinegar battery series, 
um, you, you can see the copper being, being dissolved, make, make, making that little ind indicator blue, which sets out tiny little bits of power, which then serve as another source of triggering. So the layered system here, um, which is on a very benign kind of exp expanded cloud, then might be thought of as a kind of prototypical architecture. And I hope that you might be able to see it that way. That is conceived as a chamber, as an original kind of glade that might be a gathering place that might engender a city. Here you can see some of the drawings that then, then that we do as we're building up the, the multiple layers. And they're, they're made out of individual points of touch, individual, individual sensors are very often using shape memory alloys, which are qu quiet actuators, ge gentle, rel relatively slow responses, but characterized by, by silence and stretch and contraction and then amplified further by the way we work with the materials, which are deliberately trem tremulous and, and, and resonant, harvesting vibration. And this combination then of materials tries to generate a sense of relationship with the world, which is generative, which might set out expanded physiologies outside of our own body, and which might also contribute to a sense of the earth as a place of generation, which might be built and layered and created as a, re as a renewing state. If we think about the kind of models, the fields that this speaks of, one layer might be one of, of thinking about the kind of weather or fluid systems that are increasingly familiar, and I, lo I lo love, love the increasing language that we start to have as, as designers giving us access to this kind of material. This is a computer model, but it could be an ocean, a set, set of ocean currents of multiple vortices sh shifting in countercurrent, vortex after vortex after vor vortex shift, shift, shifting and moving. This is called quasi-geostrophic uh, uh, space. Quasi meaning, meaning fluctuating, and geostro geostrophic tur turning in, uh, in, in, in the surfaces of the earth. So a lovely kind of undulating, convulsive, hiccuping kind, 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 of, uh, kind of space, perhaps the same kind of space that makes perhaps Radiohead's music so very beautiful in, in the slight lags and the uncertainties and the, and the drifts which accompany the absolute mechanical meters. If I take that kind of conception of relationships, then, the interconnectedness which is set, is set up in that, ki that kind of mechanical vision and translate it into my own perception, then I wonder whether I might be able to, to share the experience of standing in this swamp-like environment as an amphibian. Because on one hand, I can find certainty. I can navigate. And at the same time, when I stand, I'm looking there, and then I'm looking there, and then I'm looking there, and I'm finding multiple possible places that I can move. And I'm not only looking at my own potential paths, I'm also seeing the slight evidence, perhaps, of a snake over there, or of a bird fluttering there, or of a nest over there. And then I start to see a myriad of animal paths gently traced through this kind of environment. I see paths emerge progressively. I look at them and they reach further and further and become more and more detailed. And the cues, the cues that when they're close to me are tangible. Here's the displaced mud of that liquid. Here's the bent leaves. It's, cle it's clearly some something where that beaver has gone through, or, the, or that, that otter, the, 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 the kind of places of the kind of swamp that I, that I, I love being in sometime, or perhaps in a, in a dry woods in the winter, surra surrounded in an equivalent way by, by, by snow and animal tracks. But at the same time, after I'm cued by those very tangible kind of sets, sets, sets of evidence, I start to search further, and I see that this piece and this piece leads outward, and this one leads outward further. And 
it would seem that my own projection is so very active in this kind of immersion that it becomes my own possibility matrix that's expanding outward, not simply a passive response of an expert who sees what is happening, but rather someone who's actively projecting, perhaps even dreaming, perhaps imagining what might happen. Is it possible with that kind of involvement, the action of seeing such an extraordinarily riddled kind of space in my own perception, is it possible to tell the difference in those outward spaces between what is happening and what I am projecting? That experience turns into a tremendously poignant kind of quality when the edge of my own perception and the efflorescence of my imagination are both playing because my certainty about what I am inferring and what I'm projecting compared to what is there starts to collapse and, and dissolve. I can't tell the difference. Not out there. I can tell the difference with some certain set that's immediately around me. But when I'm, when I'm stretched and I'm working at the edge of, the, of, 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 of subtlety, in the experience, I cannot tell the difference between what I'm inventing and what is actually there. And that sets up a kind of a, a poignant sense, which might be tremendously unhappy, or else it might be a source of mirth, a source of kind of comfort that this kind of environment might engender that kind of seeing in me, pushing in the thoughts to me, inviting and leading and drawing out of me those kind of perceptions, rather than worrying about me being the isolated agent, which then needs to interpret and needs to navigate and shoulder every bit of responsibility. And so let, you know, let, let, let me tip into a, a, a cultural reli religious image, this lovely painting by, by Bellini, who, who pictures St. Saint, uh, Saint Francis in, in 1480 or so when he, when he painted it, with this little hut behind him, projected then, full, I guess, of catechism, full of interpretation, full of, perhaps, a cruel person would say, the quietest kind of violence of, of, of imposing his cultural creed on this scene, and yet harvesting it in at the same time seeing how he can be vulnerable, seeing how he can commune with that bird or that piece of sky, or perhaps even the latency in the soil. A lovely kind of enthusiasm and conversation then might be possible in thinking this way. So I'll just skip through a couple of crafts then that become increasingly available to us as, as designers for at first becoming sensitive and seeing what is happening in the sense that architecture can become an expanded physiology. I love this Schlieren photograph, a carefully tuned notch filter set that, al that allows the particular fluxing of air, in, the, in this case, to show its thermal displacements. And that movie isn't working. Oh, you know, it is working. Okay, so you can see the sound, the sound waves propagating out ex absolutely extraordinarily, and then this, this little environment of, 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 th of convection emanating around the hands, um, which I, I believe uh, is, is happening because there's a bit, a bit of blushing uh, in, 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 the, in the flesh that then heats, it, heats locally. Here we, here we can see this, the same thing in, the, in this Schlieren photograph. This, this, this is shared by Michelle Addington, a wonderful mechanical engineer co co colleague from, from Yale. The sense then that each of our bodies can be understood as full of thermal flux and as having a kind of expanded physiology of, of connectedness around us. So, I mean, such a very different way of thinking about what an architectural space is than Mies would have given us with his strict stage primed and cleared for action with air being empty. In our own practice, we are trying to work with component design, harvesting this kind of sensibility by using a little bit of, 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 of thermal, thermal sensing and mostly by playing a lot. And here, here you can see, for example, um, tuning a frond by looking at how it pulls heat out of my hand 
and trying to use that as a cue for, ta for taking the material as far as it possibly can go before it collapses uh, in, in, making, in tuning it for maximum response. And a very curious thing happens from, from working with materials in this way, at least uh, in, 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 in looking at, at, at this series here, because when, when you look at the first series, you can see the ambient temperature gen generated by, uh, or at least in, indicated by color. Look at the color of the fronds at the very end of the series on the bottom right compared to the beginning. You can see that they're darker. Along the way, you can see a cycling happen in which my, the, 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 the heat that comes from my breath blooms out and is taken up in, in the thinnest material and propagates into the central core. But then a cycling begins in, 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 in which that, that heat is taken over by the, by the latent heat of, of the atmosphere. And in, in fact, the, the material goes colder than, 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 than the surrounding environment. What a remarkable kind of back and forth then. I mean, as if materials are spring-loaded for their own kind of agenda of pulling and, and pushing energy and, and exchanging. A very, very different, different uh, sense then uh, than, than we might have in, in, in looking at an inert envi environment which simply supports us, in which we generate all of the meaning. This experience of pulling and pushing resulted in a, quite a happy collaboration recently with Iris Van Herpen in which clothing was, was, was generated. Here's, a, here's an early piece that we did a couple of years ago um, using that kind of frond work, thinking ab ab about the possibility space of an expanded physiology then of deliberately engendering a, 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 a kind of uh, a trembling reaction that would make you deliberately more vulner vulnerable, quivering, and uh, th th this has continued. Here's a, here's a, mo a more, more recent ha halo-like like dress, which, which was worn um, th this, this past year in the, in the form of, of, of a stole of an expanded ac ac acrylic set, set of, uh, of diagrid spars. You don't sit down in couture. Um, but you can if you work on it some more. And so there's a tangent of, of, of working with, the, with those rather playful states um, and now, now working with, with injection molded polyurethane in order to make soft elements as opposed to the rigid ther ther uh, thermoplastic ones that I was just, just showing you and working with, with, with this, this soft material that then translates the same kind of sensibility into a very sp springy, lovely, re re resilient layer which, which still functions as, as the, the kind of kinetic ex expanded skin, um, but which at the, sa at, at the same time is extremely gentle and, and, and light and sit downable. Translating this into architecture starts then with the sense of the stable house and the stable building that I've been complaining about, attributing that to my Vitruvian education. And very deliberately, takes the kind of sanctuary of these walls and these, these sta stable foundations as a kind of a petri dish that allows unapologetically fragile things to accumulate within, within this, this, this sanctuary, setting up a deliberate sensitivity, setting up a deliberate kind of reaction space, but then using the momentum and using the, the kind of experience, the craft experience that is engendered by that protected space, the play space, as the, kind of, as the kind of site for then taking on trials in which a building jacket can move outwards and subject it, itself to heavy forces and massive thermal, thermal changes through the, through the seasons and social responsibility. So, the, so the, this, a, a second state of, of development then moves into, into responsive envelopes. And the hope then, as a tan tangent of, of research and creation, would be that this can result in a reconsideration of the framing and scaffolding of, of buildings it's, itself. So that rather than the rather staid sense of making a smart building by outfitting more exotic material inside or outside, but not fundamentally inflecting things, the mutual kind, kind, of, kind of layered synthesis of, of, of those systems would allow the framing of the building itself to be custom made to receive and to be, and to be fu fundamentally in integrated. 
And perhaps that could result in an extension outward in which a building could generate its own energy and offer back and create renewal rather than be a fundamentally kind of con cons consumptive en entity in the world. I think that this optimism is justified. We can certainly speak about, being, about uh, energy generation, but it would seem that we could, that we could create about carb we could create carbon capture as well. It would seem that we can talk, talk about filtering and renewal. And, and uh, so, so it, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be completely naive. And so this sense then of profound involvement, on one hand being pulled, and the other hand generating e exchange, serves as the kind of fundamental optimism of this work. Now here you can see the kind of pr practical experiment space that, 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 that this works uh, in. This is, this is uh, the, the design model, then we built it at the Solar Decathlon House that was built on the, on the Washington Mall um, four, four years ago, um, using a, quite a different energy model in which in wintertime you harvest the sun and so you absolutely want as much transparency as possible, whereas in the, in the summer you would want to be able to close during, during the day. And so, you need, so, so the advantages of, of a highly responsive and changeable jacket in, 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 in order to work with it with energy generation and retention is used rather than the kind of the, the passive house uh, stance of trying to optimize for the heliodon in the, in, in the best sense possible, but then just having at it as, as, as one static space. This translates in the work in a couple of projects that, that I'll, I'll share in just a little bit more detail. This is a slightly older project, but it, it still serves as, as a set of basic strategies for the studio. The Venice Biennale Halazot Ground Project was framed as a set of overarching hyperbolic canopies made of corrugated diagrid snap fit ac acrylic chevron based fabrics that made an overall quite resilient structure that then was layered with a gland-like set, set of, of bladders and traps holding salts and fluids, a soil-like kind of in, in, enriched layer. And then laid on again with distributed computation, arrays of space sensors and microcontrollers that then held protocells as the basic kind of metabolism that then would process the, the, the material of the, of the canal. Within this environment, there was no sense of one central uh, kind of uh, brain. And the sense of public architecture that it offered was very dispersed, but there most certainly were quite tangible pockets that framed the gathering of people. And so it most certainly wasn't simply uh, kind of an instrumental architecture which would be only about the mechanism. On the contrary, I think it could be offered as a kind of a public architecture, an architecture which speaks of a very playful, active, mutual response between an environment and, be and, be and between, a, between an environment and a people. And if we compress this together, if we think of, of, of the layers that we see here, the hyperbolic basic resilient scaffolding, the suspended layers that we see lay, lay, laid out here in the kind of protected space, and, and then the, the, the circuitry as well. If we compress that together, then I, I hope that it would be quite convincing to imagine that as a, as a future wall and, and, and roof and canopy system. Just to, just to dwell a little bit more on, on, on the craft of this, you can see some of, some of the basic organization again in, in this drawing. And, the basic hyperbolic scaffold which, which frames the work. A scaffold which is based on dynamic force shedding rather than on resistance. And more on, on, on tensile and tensegrity forces rather than compression. And tensegrity is, is kind of a, it's, it's a lovely conception akin to our own bodies in which the, the material economy of tensile forces then is put into, into deliberate stress with, with compression struts which float within a bed, a bed of continuous ten, ten, tensile elements. And the efficiency of, of, of that then is very great. It absolutely depends on other, other stability like a, like a framing building. So, it, so it's, it's not an adequate complete system, but it has, has a, a remarkable kind of resilience and, that, and it's a resilience which is testified to 
the use of it in, uh, in situations where hundreds of thousands of people come through, sometimes quite aggressive, um, sometimes very playful, and which survives by virtue of its force shedding, but in, in, in the same way that a tech, tech, textile sheds force, an individual thread would break, but since it's supported by its neighbors, forces shed and are shared and are profoundly inter interconnected, and so, so therefore the composite becomes extraordinarily strong. Here's, here's just the structural unit, um, an, an individual snap fit chevron, which makes a tetrahedron, which then is multiplied in, into a corrugated diagrid, the, ba the basic fabric, the resilient fabric that makes the system. The, the connections between things then start and this, this, this is a material equivalent of, uh, of, of, of the, the kind of craft that we've been speaking about in the, in the last couple of, of days. But here, it's entirely physical. That is, the sharing of tremulous vibrations and the interference, the kind of stick, stip, st st stick sputtering of, of elements over overlapping that make a kind of an active textile-like fabric. Organized then as a very, very primitive interactive communicative system in terms of, of multiple controls in tribal loops. Here you can see the different species la laid out and then general control systems for each of those species. These are helical chains of columns and then active filters driven by shape memory alloy, another active whole grove of, of, of cr cricket-like resonators which serve as lures to encourage hum human interaction which then is harvested by, by, the, by other elements which are, which are housing the little bit metabolic flasks which want to have human interaction because they're, they're stimul they are stimulated by it, stimulated in, in, in the sense that little bursts of, 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 of light create heat, create, stim stimulate the growth of each, each individual protocell. This organization then, you can see, is a very primitive tribal layered system but which has certain overall functions as, as, as well. Su supervising controllers that pull the group and then filter out the, pot, the, the, the information that they are individually actuating and then give instructions and allow them to work coherently as well. Coherently in neighbor responses and large reactive neighbor responses and occasionally when there's enough stimulation, whole system kind of chaotic tumbling, almost catastrophic re reactions akin to thunder and wet in, in the weather. You can see something of, of, of that happening in a related in installation in, in Sydney um, when, when, this, when the sensors are, are tuned too high right now and the entire system is kind of fr freaking out um, before we allowed it to, to quiet down. In a new project, we are finally moving to the sense that this, these systems, rather than having no brain and no consciousness, um, could possibly learn. And so what you see here is, is a, a sketch for a meshed tri triangular framework of tentacles which stir the air and, uh, and by, by, vir by virtue of the triangular placements make cupola forms which are frame, frames for, for inhabitable space, but in a continual, ma continual matrix in which each element is, is responding to, to multiple neighbors. And also, each, each element is working in multiple ways because there is sound, protocell, and, and light all, all working together. Here you can see the curiosity-based algorithm placed as an extra element on top of the existing occupancy maps which determine the relationships between elements and also the pre-scripted behaviors which, which form the basic re reflexes of, of the system. And so the, the, the CBLA, the cur curiosity-based system, which is driven by extra information, that, that is, if change happens, then that is interesting and, then, and that, that drives it forward. But here you can see that it, it's working together with the, with the pre-existing information. And so that, so that, that, that produces, uh, the kind of, I, I guess, the resilience of, of the system. Here, too, you can also, also see that the individual elements are chained together so that one sensor will influence multiple tribes. You can see the, the infrared uh, proximity sensor in the, in the middle, for example, uh, approaching two different analyses. 
one judging this, the synchronization of the LED group, which, which, uh, which, which controls the protocells, and at the same time feed, feeding into the synchronization of, of adjacent tentacles. By tentacle, I mean a frond-like element driven by shape memory alloy, which when chained together into three, makes a coherent, uh, a coherent cupola, which could stir the air, akin to a leaky heart valve, or, or, or uh, perhaps a, a lymph valve, uh, which, which, which would pump lymph, lymph through our system. And you can see, you just see the kind of pathetically sim simple early tests of, 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 uh, of, of this system. I said please, yes. In, in which there's basic calibration of the system. This, the, the, these are just, just very early weeks for, for, for this new system. And so what's, what's happening here is that there are basically random set, sets of, of possible actuations, but then, then which feed back using proprioception, mean, meaning that anything that happens is also supervised by a sensor which therefore can tell it that it's happening. And the calibration of that so that then the system can learns to predict that it has the ability to do, to do something is a, is a sort of primary response. And, and then you can see the same thing happening in, in, uh, in, a, in a cluster with, within the studio as then multiple systems are learning to be coherent together. Now this is very early days and the, the, the function of learning to stir air effectively and learning to gravitate to a human occupation in a particular place um, and what the, what the longevity of that would be is, uh, is, is ahead of us. Um, we, can, we can't offer any, any certainty about that. But it, do, it does represent a kind of a tangent that is a, that it, that is a, a, a direction for us. So let, let me sum up. I've tried to talk about a series of projects which have been asking fundamental questions about architecture. And I've tried to frame them in a rather emotional way that is of serving a sense that I am standing here and that you're here and that we make architecture as an act of emplacement, of engendering a way of, of relating to the world in the way we frame our space and in the relationships that we offer. And I've also tried to suggest that rather than a classical mode which tries to reduce its interaction, that tries to make something as efficient as possible by following a, 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 an equation which has minimum possible envelopes and maximum possible territory, the kind of purity of that arithmetic, I've tried to suggest that a form language which would prioritize maximum reaction and maximum exposure can be a tremendously refreshing kind of quality, can offer the kind of interest and curiosity and interconnection that can offer a different kind of resilience in relationships. And I've tried then to, to show some projects in which that kind of form language has been in very practical terms played out through manipulation of materials, through molding multiple systems and having them work together I didn't show you the, the, the first film, which, which, which showed quite, quite directly those, those, those systems triggering each other in, in a kind of lo lovely example of autopoiesis, of, of the, 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 the idea of, of self-generating self uh, systems complementing each other. But I do hope that this, this brief talk offers a sense of touch and intimacy and full-blooded involvement as a kind of as a way of, ge of generating a very, very satisfying and refreshing architecture. Now, just, just a, a final comment then. I mean, if, if, if I think about the kind of, of relationship system that active, responsive architecture offers then, and if I think about the kind of problematic sense that I was trying to demonstrate when I was talking about the swamp, and my inability to tell the difference between what I thought I saw and what I was inventing or projecting or dreaming through, through, through my own fictions at the outer edges of that involvement. When that kind of certainty changes 
because I am not simply a stable, proud person, but also I want something to be possible in my pathfinding. And so I project outward. Then this kind of curious, fl fluttering, mutual space that results, the space in which making yourself dizzy is perhaps uh, an, a norm, might, I think, become a tremendously positive way of thinking of a kind of architecture. Perhaps not a main government chamber where you make decisions about whether to go to war or whether to invest a whole, whole public, but a kind of architecture which prioritizes the edges of things and transitions and possibilities for growth and possibilities for integration, a kind of an ecumenical space. And this might be supported then, moving through new physics and new abilities to measure and speak about complex systems, by a psychology as well, which might be a step towards the neurology that I, that I hope I'll, I'll have a chance to collaborate with. And I'm showing this slide which is one um, which perhaps illustrates the theory of Donald Winnicott, a lo lovely mid-century psychologist who theorizes the formation of the psyche in infants. What is the consciousness of someone before they've been born, or while they're being born, or in the space of those very short times before they have learned that, them, that they are a person? Is it necessary to prioritize independence and agency and power and individuality and hardening the boundaries that circle you? Is it necessary to take you on a path as deliberately as possible into distinct isolation, into distinct boundaries and the safe zone of having a clear skin? Winnicott certainly speaks about the kind of conditions that allow people to acquire agency and he speaks about them, however, by talking about transitional objects. A transitional object like a lovey or a dipy. The kind of object that you hold and it is so utterly familiar to your own body that you forget or you never knew in the first place that it was separate from you. And you relate to it absolutely as an extension of your own physiology. An utterly different class of, of object than a tool which you learn to manipulate the world with. It's a very curious kind of intermediate state, and Winnicott speaks quite specifically about architecture and cultural fields also, expanding the sense that these kind of objects can be incredibly valuable bridges for negotiating and discovering mutual agency. If we think about architecture that way and follow Winnicott, then maybe there could be a state in which we don't deliberately take away a blankie, because after all, it's an illusion. That's not part of your body, and it's dirty. Instead, the kind of playful and very gentle navigation of these ambiguous and partial objects which rest around us might be decaffected, might dissolve. Identity might condense into a much more nuanced set of relationships in which we are connected in a myriad of ways with our environment, rather than thrust into a polarized state in which our skin and our identity and our name are our possessions, but other things are lost. I love this kind of optimism then of an architecture which is very deliberately interconnected as accompanying a vision of, of, of responsiveness. And I hope that that might, might serve as a, as a way, perhaps, in, into a discussion of, of tectonics and, and inter, interconnection of, of control systems as well. So the sphere that I was complaining about at the beginning, just this fi 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 final image, the, the raindrop then, might turn into instead a kind of field of condensation, of, of fluxing, in which things most certainly do take bounded forms, but also are released again as, as well in, into vapors and, and humidity. And perhaps that might engender a sense that responsive architecture, enabled by, by new technology, might offer some renewing qualities so I hope that's a contribution. Thank you.